You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast, episode number 163. Bigfoot's home saved, chupacabra, lime green puppy, and unintentional snake pizza. Yeah. So welcome back to the podcast. It begins again, episode number 163. Glad to have you here. If it's your very first time tuning into the Creep Geeks Podcast, what is this podcast all about? Creep Geeks Podcast is an offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the paranormal, cryptid, strange, the silly, and trending tech topics circulating the web. Broadcasting paranormal news and fun stories from our underground bunker in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Yes, yes, indeed. So we're back again talking to you, and, uh, you know, hey, welcome. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, we very much appreciate it. If you tuned in for the very first time, we very much appreciate it. If you'd like to give us a rating and help support the show, you can do that wherever you listen to the show. Yeah. Yeah, so wherever you're listening right now. And this show is available on all major platforms. You can find us on iHeartRadio, um, SoundCloud, Pandora, Spotify, uh, Spotify, Google Play Music, podcasts. What? Google Play Podcasts. Google Play Podcast Music. <laughs> Apple Stitcher, Podcasts. Radio.com. Basically, pretty much anywhere you can pick up an RSS feed, you can listen to us, and we very much appreciate it. You can also listen to us on our Facebook group. We have a Facebook group called Creep Geeks Facebook Group. Yes. And you can also listen to the podcast on our website, creepgeeks.com. We have a little link that you can click on to play the podcast. We also have a link where you can click and submit a story if you have one yeah. or something that you would like to share. And we do read those occasionally, so if you send one in, we might even go through and uh, be able to uh, talk to you about it. <laughs> yeah, It's supposed to automatically notify us when we have events that occur on that particular page, and sometimes it does not. Or if you want to just give us a phone call, and leave a voicemail. We have that set up for you. It's toll free. That phone number is 575-208-4025. That's right. Roswell area code. Yep. So anyway, I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And this is the Creep Geeks Podcast. Oh gosh. Yeah, there you go. So anyway, one of the things that we do when we do a podcast is we try to come up with interesting and just wonderful titles to draw you in. Oh. Not necessarily clickbait or anything, but <laughs> you know, hey. Well, it's good, you know. We like those interesting titles because I kind of like the titles that you used to see when you see, like, weekly world news. Yeah. Like, Bat Boy Lives on the Moon, that kind of thing. So when I see stuff like Bigfoot's Home Save, Chupacabra, Lime Green Puppy, and Unintentional Snake Pizza, I'm in. It's, it is clickbait. <laughs> it's not. It's all true. It's news. It's paranormal and weird news. It's what we do. We do the podcast pretty much weekly. So... If you've tuned in and you like us, let us know. If it's your very first time tuning in, you will like us, let us know. And if you've been here since the start, thank you. Yes. All right. Well, that's all we got for this podcast. Would you stop? <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. No. Okay. So anyway, a couple different ways you can support the show. The Facebook group is fun to participate and interact with. The website's there for you to check and peruse at your leisure. All of our show notes are included there as well. And besides the fit Facebook group, be sure to like the official Facebook page, which is Creep Geeks Podcast. Yes. Like and follow the page so you can get notifications as far as when we do new shows. Yes. That's nice. Mm-hmm. We also have an Instagram page where we post our wonderful photographies. Yes, we will provide all social links in the show notes for the podcast episode. Yes. Very nice. 
So anyway, moving back into the podcast, got a couple of different things to talk about today, and we thought we'd find some interesting things to talk about, and we believe we have done that, so we will continue. Okay, so the past couple of three episodes of the podcast, we've been talking about these Colorado drones. Yeah. And they're really not Colorado drones, they're just drones that have been spotted over Colorado, and people are like, what are they doing? Yeah. Why are they there? Parts of the Midwest and Southwest. Yeah, that kind of thing. So um, it it keeps making the news, and so we got to keep talking about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, I personally think these drones are uh, government drones, you know, from the government. Because if, if you can buy a drone and fly it around, why can't they dry or have drones and fly them around as well? And there's drones that, you know, we have like the big ones, like the big Predator drones. And I'm sure they have other drones. And plus, they also have a drone counter uh, team, drone, some kind of exercise. They have ways to teach the American service member how to defend themselves against drones. Okay. And I think that a lot of these sightings that have been occurring over military installations are exactly that. They're exercises, probably counter drone exercises at that. But it's been making the news that these big drones are kind of flying around and they have to be big because of how long they last. And they're being seen in areas that are slightly unusual. And people have all these questions and these questions have been going out to the FAA and the government and local authorities going, what is it? What are they doing? <laughs> and so shockingly enough, they're not really getting any, any answers. And that that's weird because it's state authorities that have no answers. And they've well, even communicated yeah. with each other and they have no answers. So state goes to federal or military and it's like, we don't know what you're talking about. This kind of goes back to an issue I had during the whole desert storm thing. Really? Yeah, which was, I think, 29 years ago here recently. So if you're a service member and you were in Desert Storm or Desert Shield or whichever one it was, because I can't remember because like, one turned into the other. Thank you very much. Uh, you know. Yeah. And one of the things the problem, one of the things that I had an issue with and was a problem was um, it seemed like whenever we were going to do a military action, CNN and places like that would go ahead and put it on the news. Yeah. Because they were embedded, right? So they were right there. So it would be like you would see live broadcasts of them, of them in the area and then you know, talk about the exercise that was, and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And so a lot of these uh, um, exercises or actions or campaigns, whatever you want to call them, were kind of given away by the fact that the news was reporting what exactly was going to happen, which in a way is good because it gave people, a lot of people a chance to get out of there before, you know, Stuff started happening. Yeah. But at the same time, you kind of give away what you're doing, which yeah. sort of sets you up. Which meant if there were opposing fo- forces that had their their stuff together, they could make a mess. They would know, yeah, they and, would know right where you are, and yeah. they could, you know, do all that stuff. Um, fortunately, that was not necessarily an issue. So when I see things like, well, how come the government's not telling us? Well. Need to know. Yeah, and there is a thing called need to know, and I understand the whole idea that, you know, the government works for you and all that sort of thing, but at the end of the day, the government tries to protect the United States, and that's, you know, all about that national security stuff. So it doesn't shock me too much that with these drone sightings, that they've got no answers, really, from the government. And by the government, I mean the militaries. Yeah. Because if you were conducting, you know, counter-drone exercises and you had developed techniques and methods to protect against drones, would you just advertise them to everybody? No, but this latest news kind of throws a wrench into my position on that because I agree. However, this most recent article to hit the news with one of these mystery drones possibly interacting or getting too close to a medical dispatch helicopter, that bothers me. Well, it bothers me too, but let's look at it for a second. Did the drone interact with the medical helicopter or was the medical helicopter in the flight path? Yeah. Now, I understand so, medical helicopters in like, you know, like a, was it night flight and, or life flight, all those, you know, they, they, in, they're there for a purpose. You know, they fly in, they pick people up, they expedite them to whatever emergency medical care they need. And Especially it's there. in the Southwest, though. This could have been like a rock climber fall or a rattlesnake. Well, yeah, climb. it could have been anything, right? Yeah. But my point is, is that were the drones there already doing what they've been doing? Mm-hmm. 
and then the medical helicopter had to go, right? Yeah. Or was the medical helicopter already there and the drones came in on them? That's kind of frightening. Well, I mean, but, and see, yeah. and this goes goes to, I guess, just basically proving the FAA's point, Federal Aviation Administration, that everything that's in the air should have an identifier and be tracked in real time. Oh, that's not to fair. help prevent. But that's exactly what's going to happen, right? Yeah. You know, because you got to have that whole safety thing. And so the Colorado Department of Public Safety is going to start using ground-based teams and aircraft to investigate these mysterious drones because of a close call with the medical helicopter. And I do understand that drones definitely pose a threat when they're in the wrong place when it comes to other flying aircraft. Nobody's disputing that. Yeah, but... But I do think a lot of what's been reported in these near misses and all that stuff are greatly exaggerated. So is this a almost a wag the dog in the drone world. Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, they'll say that, you know, we, oh, you had a close call with a medical helicopter when you were, you know, anywhere between a mile you or put some, 200 miles away. You put somebody's what. life at risk. Yeah. I, I mean, so, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things. And so I'm not disputing that drones can be dangerous, especially in the hands of the stupid. But at the same time, it's probably not as bad as what we really think. And obviously this is I mean, a bird's more dangerous and is more of a threat to, you know, on a regular basis, right? In everyday life, a bird's more of a threat to. And this is obviously not the average citizen and the average citizen's drone because we haven't been able to catch them on camera. They're huge. We haven't been able to figure out where they come from. This isn't the lone work of a Yeah, these things are allegedly weighing over 50 pounds and six foot wingspans and the ability to hover for over 90 minutes. Yeah. It's just, they're flying grid patterns. I remember when we lived in New Mexico and Rio Rancho and we had that one hospital that constantly had helicopter like deploys because they were getting like mountain climbers and well, they, bad remote. It wasn't just, you know, but. But they, then they were car crashes and everything. Yeah. They weren't just, you know. Yeah, but they they had a specific center at that one for certain things. Right. And there was that one balloon fiesta season that was really hairy because people were accidentally, the wind was catching them and putting their hot air balloons a little too close to that. Yeah, and so they were all breaking the airspace, <laughs> and it was a big deal. And yeah. And, you know, and honestly, if you're in a balloon, you have control as a balloon pilot, but you don't have that much control. You're still, you know, and you're still, you're kind of stuck because how much control do you actually have in a balloon? You have a little bit. You, I mean, your, your real control is being able to put it down. Yeah. Which But if the wind's like did. whipping like 30 miles an hour and you're trying to put it down, you're still going 30 plus miles an hour trying to put this balloon down. But yeah. Yeah. So to imagine instead of balloons, these drones with technology... Yeah. I don't know. I but, you know, and like even some of the articles, like mysterious drones spotted swarming Colorado skies. They're, they've been seen over specific locations. It's not like they're flying all over Colorado. Yeah. So I think a lot of this is becoming sort of a drone flap thing. And it more than likely is the military that's doing exercises and counter drone exercises and, and doing all that sort of thing. And I personally think that drone technology has been in place for a very long time. You have the whole swarm technology and all this other crazy stuff. And, you know, the problem is, is that you know, they got the speculation of military testing, experiments, exercises. But, see, the military agencies have denied it or doing anything with these drones. And also, who were they asking? Yeah. You know what I mean? I if you, if you ask, like, you know, I mean, who are you asking in, in the <laughs> government? They're literally, like, going on Google. Department of Transportation. Calling you know, the front gate of the closest military uh, yeah, base. Yeah, like, are you guys it's flying like, drones? And you it's got Bob. Some, He's like, uh. You got some low-level enlisted <laughs> guy who's standing watch, and his, his watch is to answer, or her watch is to answer the phone. Yeah. They're like, are you flying drones? No. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> you know, you, you only know as far as what you know, you yeah. know. So, I, mean, I don't know. I, I think that... This um, is, is eventually going to blow over, but or somebody's going to shoot one down. That's probably what's going to happen. I I have my tinfoil hat on right now because the more I think about it, the more I think, especially with this medical helicopter incident, this is going to be agenda, the FAA being Absolutely. able to push their agenda. They've already started with it. <clears throat> you know, and this yeah. will just further cement civilian ability to fly drones. Yeah. So, not happening. See, okay, it says... You know, ABC News reports that the close call with the call flo- uh, close call with the flight for life. There we go. Helicopter occurred Tuesday night um, near Fort Morgan, Colorado. 
An aircraft known as a multi-mission aircraft uses heat signatures to track objects, but no drones were detected Monday night when the MMA flew a mission that was nearly five hours long. So they didn't find anything going down on Monday, but then the next day they sort of found something, right? They seen some drones, but it doesn't necessarily say what the actual incident was. Yeah. So really what was the incident? I don't know, you know, and... And this is still within that, that remote area. Yeah. Because I'm looking at the, the maps again. Fort Morgan. It's out there. So. So, yeah, there's not really a whole lot. It just basically says a close call with a medical helicopter is raising the stakes as authorities investigate a fleet of drones. Now that's a fleet of drones flying night missions over northeastern Colorado. Yeah. So, and then, you know, let's muddy up the waters by sending up these aircraft to search for the drones. It's just becoming a thing, you know, and it's kind of like, and I, and I totally, I don't want to discount anybody, you know, who's in there going, oh, these things are dangerous. And I'm going to put it to you like this. If you haven't flown drones, and I'm not talking about the little ones you buy from the toy store, but if you haven't flown drones, like nice drones and aerial photography drones, and if you're one of these people who have not had any experience flying these things, then you're probably the worst person to make a comment about it. You know what I mean? Because these things are involved. I got you know? my drone off wish. <laughs> no, I have never flown one, but I've seen them. You know, these, because a lot of the attitude is like if they, if one flies down your street or over your house, you can just shoot it down and that, no, you can't do that. There's rules, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, for example, the drone that we have, as soon as you turn it on and you, you're kind of get ready, you have to lock satellites. It has to know its GPS position. If there's any software or firmware updates or local updates in the flight patterns it does all that stuff for you and you have to sit and there you in the can't field and wait for it <laughs> yeah you can't do anything until it's been up to date and ready to fly there's there's gps or geofencing involved there's all sorts of stuff that happens with these drones yeah so if you're i don't know an armchair drone pilot i mean come on man Let, let's let's put it in perspective but see none of that stuff seems to matter yeah. i don't know what these drones are actually doing out there but i think it's it's more than likely military and be doing like training and that sort of thing. I mean, sounds good to me. Let's get everybody as trained up as possible so we don't have any incidents. But at the same time, let's be logical and realistic about the entire thing. Yeah. You know, (laughs) Uh, I mean, we're launching satellites and all sorts of crazy stuff's going on and we got other stuff to worry about right now. And as far as I know, these drones haven't really been doing anything except for just whizzing around at night. But this new incident kind of changes it a little. Yeah, but does it? What was the actual incident? I don't know. I, have I clicked can't on three find, different news articles. Right, and that's my, kind of my point. I can't find anything that lays out what the actual incident was. I know. And the only thing you find is like, Colorado to deploy more teams to investigate mystery drones after a close call with medical helicopter. Well, in aviation, a close call can be, you know, oh man, this thing was like 1,000 feet, 5,000 feet away from me. A hundred yards. Yeah, or more, well, a hundred yards would be three. But, I mean, yeah. you see what I'm saying though, right? So really, what is this? I, I kind of want to know some details here, like what, what's going on, you know? And yeah. I also want to know, was the drone operating in its area and the medical helicopter was there to respond to something? Or was the medical helicopter already in its particular area and the drones went in its area? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Because they have some drones out there that you're not, you can't, you can't fly into those areas if they've already been cordoned off or been geofenced, they won't even let you. Like if you're so cl- if you're depending on where you are to an airport, it won't let you fly that way. It won't let you do that sort of thing. So that's why I'm trying to figure out kind of what's going on here. Because that's the real danger. If you have things that are put in place with a commercially bought drone that keep you from being able to do the bad stuff, but anybody can make a drone yeah. that doesn't have all that, or the government doesn't have to, you know, adhere to all that. I think that's a bigger problem or could be more potentially a larger problem in the future with home built drones, not building in all those safety measures like geofencing and that sort of thing designed to keep drones out of airspace where it doesn't belong. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. So that's kind of our drone update. There was a, a close call with a medical helicopter and we don't really have much details, but the saga continues, I guess. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, it's kind of hard to say. But that's all I got to say about that. Okay. All right, so moving along into the podcast, we got to get into some news here. And this is something that I've seen 
Uh, a little bit of an article. It was written by Nick Redfern at Mysterious Universe. I like Nick Redfern. He writes a lot, like a lot, about interesting stuff, and he's got his theories on things. Some of them, I think, are uh, really cool. You know, hey, yeah, that's cool. That's a cool idea. Really well, thought out. <laughs> makes you think about stuff like that. And some things, I think, well, maybe a little bit out there, man. Yeah. But it's always entertaining to read, and... He's done a three-part series concerning why he believes that many of the crypto cryptozoological creatures, like Bigfoot, mm-hmm. lake monsters, dogman, alien cats, and stuff like that, um, are actually supernatural in nature. Supernatural how? Well, so, he doesn't say. Okay. Because in this particular article, I'm not going to go back through his other articles and stuff, but he basically says is that, you know, he thinks that some of these are actually supernatural in nature and they should not be considered to be part of cryptozoology. Oh. <laughs> like, let's just do it like this and break it down the nuts and bolts. Is a ghost cryptozoology? No. Right. But also, so, like, I get into- When you say, hold on, I'm not yeah. done. So when you say supernatural, what do you think of? Ghost. Spiritual. Source. I think more ghosts, okay. and I think this is where this is kind of leading, you know. Yeah. Because nobody really uses the ter- term Fortean or Fortean, depending on yeah. how you want to say it. But we, we use the term paranormal, and when you say paranormal, a lot of people think the first thing they think of is ghosts. When you say supernatural, same thing. A lot of people think of as ghosts. But as an all-inclusive, an all-inclusive term, I would count ghosts being in the supernatural realm yeah. and the paranormal realm. I would also include Bigfoot being in the supernatural realm and paranormal realm, right? Hmm. And animals and Loch Ness and all stuff, sort of all one thing, which would be more Fortean or Fortean. But um, see, and for me. I think the terminology should be paranatural. Yeah, that's true. But nobody's using that one. So, But he's kind of saying that, you know, we can't count or we shouldn't be counting things like Dogman, Bigfoot, and these big cats that were in the UK, along and with s- now the Chupacabra of Puerto Rico in the same vein as cryptozoological. And see, I get super critical with that stuff because I've always had certain beliefs about certain quote unquote cryptids. Like Bigfoot, I think is a could be a terrestrial biological origin creature, but then I don't feel the same way about skinwalkers, completely supernatural. Well, yeah. You know? So but if he's alluding to the fact that most of them are supernatural in nature, that's that's new to me. So Well, the problem that you actually have yeah. is that it can be supported both ways. It's purely a biological, possibly natural, just undiscovered thing. Yeah. Like a Bigfoot or even a chupacabra. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But there's also reports where <clears throat> people have seen like aliens or UFOs or flying saucers, whatever, reported in the same area as Bigfoot. Some have even said that they've seen Bigfoot getting out of UFOs. Mm-hmm. And there's also been theories or reports, I should say, where people will see, you know, Bigfoot steps out of wherever, like out of nowhere in the scene, then steps back into nowhere, like a portal type thing. So there's reports to support most any and all of these sort of theories out there. And the one that he brings up with this uh, article he wrote uh, for Mysterious Universe is the Chupacabra, a cryptozoolo- cryptozoological animal? No. No. Yeah. And he brings up a story, you know, talking about Puerto Rico, mid-1990s, the phenomenon of the Chupacabra exploded all across Puerto Rico, right? Mm -hmm. Talks a little bit about vampires and some other things that kind of happened there, but he he basically talks about a story, right? Yeah. And, you know, this kind of ties into the whole vampires on the loose because Chupacabra is, in Spanish, a goat sucker. Okay. You know, because it sucks the blood out of goats, which is the same thing as vampires vampiristic or vampiristic behavior, right? As an indicator of sucking the blood out, and that's something that vampires do. So when you had these reports of strange killings that began uh, to surface, right, from other parts of the island, and we're talking about Puerto Rico, yeah, the creatures were on the move. And they're talking about these goat suckers, which is, you know, Chupacabra, right? Mm -hmm. And so the population was on edge. Media had something new and sensational reportable on. They kept doing it. It's turbulent, strange time. But what exactly was responsible for all the killings? And this is from his article that we're reading. So, yes, there were plenty of dead animals, but unfortunately there was no solid eyewitness testimony relative to the killers themselves. That is, until August 1995, where a woman named Madeline Tolentino, Mm -hmm. 
um, who lived in Puerto Rico and basically changed everything because her description of the creature that she encountered, which was close to her mother's home, was disturbing. And it was a basically a description eagerly embraced by the island's, island's media and investigators of monsters and mysteries. And the picture that's depicted here is the one that looks like an alien with the spikes. Yeah. Because we've seen the Chupacabra pictures where it looks kind of like, uh, you know, a coyote or a dog or mangy dog kind of standing up and looking kind of like that, right? Yeah. Like a goat sucker would. And then all of a sudden Chupacabra turned into this alien with horns on it. You know what I mean? Like the, the figure of the small alien, like a gray or something, but it's more green, has the big eyes and has the horns on the head and it runs down the back and like little like reptile legs. And see, I grew up just the opposite, though. I remember it being described not necessarily like this image, but similar. But then all of a sudden in the 2000s, it started being basically a dehydrated coyote with mange. Well, that's the ones that they were saying that they were seeing, but okay. I've... You know, I've always known it to be the other way around where it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't look like an alien goat sucker. It looked more like an, a real animal. Hmm. And then it switched. And then it's gone to, if you find a dehydrated dog, it's a goat sucker, right? It's a chupacabra. Yeah. And it sort of depends on where you see that. Because Puerto Rico is not the only place where these things have been seen. Yeah. Like Costa Rica. And then in Mexico, of course. And then in Texas, Texas New Mexico, anywhere desert and sort of borderland. Yeah. Or border town. So she's seen this thing, and she said that basically the creature was around three feet in height, bipedal, ran in a weird hopping fashion, had large black eyes, bony fingers on each hand, overly long arms and legs, right? Yeah. Kind of a leathery, like, li- or feathery line running down its back. And so it's kind of this crazy-looking thing. And, you know, sharp spines, vicious-looking fangs. And so with this description, which kind of matches like a, almost like a small alien running around, like our typical big-headed alien with you know, spikes on its head, mm-hmm. sort of ties into like the long-standing UFO story. You know, there's a UFO that crashed in the heart of Puerto Rico's um, rainforest, El Yunyu, I can't pronounce it, in, in 84. It looks like El Unique. <laughs> it does, but it's like young, young. But, and so, you know, this is... So the theory kind of boils down to, okay, this alien UFO thing crashed in rainforest in 1984, and then here it is a little bit later on, about nine years later on, you've got this, like, these things running around sucking the blood out of stuff. Yeah. that looked like aliens with spines on their backs and, like, running around. And so there you go. They're supernatural. (sighs) So I guess the supernatural part, you know, does that come from, you know, if you look at, Cryptozoology is being naturalistic and supernatural is being everything else, including UFOs and aliens and ghosts and all that sort of thing. Then you could make the argument that it fits in that particular realm. I don't know. I, and it's funny that right? I would get so black and white in this topic, but I, I don't know. Well, the article also goes yeah. around and talks about triangle shaped aircraft and, and everything else and, you know, so, that sort of thing as well. So, but it, so what is it? You know what I mean? Do we still consider, um, it even talks about Whitley Shriver's book communion, right? Yeah. About, you know, all that sort of thing. So, you know, what are we looking at here? Is the chupacabra bi- bipedal spiked and menacing or is it more natural, more natural? And is it related to the UFO crash that happened in the rainforest and somehow or another they linked together? You know what I mean? So, I mean. I don't know. And it's where I get a little too literal with the words. Because, again, for me, supernatural has some sort of magic or spiritual connotation to me. Whereas cryptozoology, it's of a biological origin. Yeah, more naturalistic. And then, like, if we're going to go ahead and say chupacabra is a UFO hybrid or an escaped experiment from a crash UFO, then it goes straight into the UFO category. Yeah. You know, ufology category. Um, So did it come from an alien craft or not? I don't know. Who knows? The fact that it crashed in 1984, like in a rainforest out there, I'm like, didn't some movie come out the same time with that same theory? I don't know. I was 14. Probably not. I mean, like, Maybe Predator Repo Man. Or... I don't know. Was it 84? Maybe it's... I don't know. 
I want to say it was 84. No, Predator, no I, don't, I don't think Predator came out in 84. I think it came out later than that. I don't know. I remember watching that movie like 100 times when I was in the Navy. So oh, 87. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I kind of understand what he's trying to say yeah. based off of this and the reports, and, and I believe that he actually knows this person and all that sort of thing. It, it would kind of make sense. And you could, and, but with all the other reports and things like that, you could sort of tie it all into being supernatural versus cryptozoological when you compare like Bigfoot and things. I mean, um, but you could make the argument the other way around saying, well, you know, hey, we've seen Bigfoot and there wasn't a UFO around, you know, and it hid by ducking behind a tree and it didn't just disappear. It just, you know, so I don't know. But I mean, it's an interesting sort of premise that there, and it, it kind of explains why you don't necessarily or, if they are supernatural in origin, then when you see it and then all of a sudden you don't can tie into that. And sort of kind of the same theory I have of a lot of things is that, you know, yeah, the reason why you see a pterodactyl flying down the road above your car is that it's there in your reality, in your universe, in your world. And then it pops through a portal and goes back to where it came from. Right? Yeah. I mean, who's to say? I mean, in one of our podcasts from the past, we we have scientists trying to punch a hole in a parallel universe. They're like, punch a hole through our reality into that reality to prove that parallel universes exist. So what if that's already naturally occurring? Because, I mean, you got the the big collider, right? The Hadron Mm -hmm. Collider. So everything's, and and they talk about that too, sort of in a loose way, where it's like, oh, the reason why we're having all these Mandela effects is because this thing keeps, you know, punching holes in our reality and it's, it's basically making the veil between our universe and a parallel universe, right? Sort of thin and they touch and it sort of changes things. So every time earth 32 touches us, we lose a eighties cartoon character. It changes. There's even a theory that somehow or another, our universe got completely wiped out and has been replaced and that we're actually in another universe as in we are living in a different universe in a different world in a different time it's exactly the same, but different. And the architects had to rebuild it the best they knew how right. or something. Which sort of. Which I would get, because could you imagine being like the low middle management guy that has to make sure he gets all the DVDs from the 1990s correct? Yeah, and he skipped one, and all of a sudden everybody's like, well, Sinbad, he was in that movie. <laughs> so the theory, I think, and I, I, it's one of those things where I started to read it and said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to be a part of this right now, <laughs> was that... Our somehow or another, when I guess when the, if I remember, and I might be wrong, and if I'm wrong, correct me either way, but you can't prove it, so it doesn't matter anyway, right? <laughs> Is that okay? They fired up the collider and it basically it zapped our existence. And what happened was our, our universe just basically had nowhere to be anymore. And so our universe has been replaced by another universe, or we re replaced another universe that was already dead. Oh. So when we fired it up, Boom. We, we wiped out another universe in ours, and so they just sort of replaced it. God, that's bugging me right now. Yeah. Cause, no, well, because odd that you say this. I was looking through a Twitter f- thread about a couple days ago, and somebody was like, what if our universe has been dead since 2016? And I'm like, how did th- first off, how did this end up in my Twitter feed? Yeah. Second, there was all these people either agreeing with them or claiming – yeah, I think we died in 2012 or like all of us yeah. together. And it kind of spooked me. And so, the, yeah, and that sort of ties into the whole thing. I think they're loosely tying in or I'm loosely tying in or whatever, where, yes, our universe has actually ended, but has been extended because we have taken the place of another dead universe. Yeah. And we'll never know. And all of a sudden when this, when our universe just stops, it just stops and we will have no idea. <sighs> And then, and see, because when you look at that sort of thing, it's like, okay, well, this is how dreams work, where you have an, a crazy hyper-realistic dream that you know is not a dream. Maybe that's what that is. All these universes that just sort of abruptly end, you're catching the fragments of that because you've been a part of that. Because if you look at the whole alternate universe and theories like Earth-12 and Earth-32 and Earth-47, which all the comic books talk about, right? Mm-hmm. There are different versions of you everywhere. And if you've ever had a version where you're in a dream doing something that you would normally never, ever do or be in a situation where you would never, ever be in that situation, but you feel like you've been there, done that, and you know what's going on and what has to be done, that's why. So 
does that mean? So there's like a million versions of yourself doing a million different things, and you know a little bit about each one of those. That's why it feels weird but familiar all at the same time. That I feel bad for Bigfoot now, because what if he's just dreaming and he accidentally ends up here? Hey. And he's like, do, 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 do. He's like, and instead of like the the high school, middle school dream where you wake up and go to school and do a book report naked in front of the class, he's like showing up in some awkward territory here in the United States that he's used to. It may to be being, entirely possible that he's you know, just been doing his own thing and he's just as shocked when he sees us as we are him. Like, oh, yeah. what the hell is that? He's it's like, sort of the same thing. He's like, I don't remember this being a densely populated area. <laughs> yeah, or it's the same to him, but things were slightly different. Oh. I mean, if that if that's the case, and you have this alternate sort of never ending, you know, universe after universe or existence after existence, and it's all connected by portals and all this other crazy stuff, then all this stuff makes sense. But it also makes everything not matter almost. Well, that's the entire thing to the whole thing, is that nothing really matters. You know, I mean, and and that ties into some of these you know really famous Hollywood stars that have like sort of transcended above themselves now because they said the same thing that nothing matters. I mean like Jim Carrey. Right. And Jim Carrey's one. Uh, I was going to say Matthew McConaughey, but it's not Matthew McConaughey. It's somebody like Matthew McConaughey. He just has this sort of like nothing matters, man. Oh yeah. It doesn't matter what you do. Cause it really doesn't matter. You Bill know? Murray. Yeah. Bill Murray is supposed to be one like that. Cause what? And, and you know who else is supposed to be one that's kind of like that? Yeah. Tom Hanks. Because what does Bill Murray do? He just goes and exists in the moment with the people he's with. Yeah. Doing normal things and it freaks people out. Tom Hanks does the same thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, man. And Jim Carrey has been saying that nothing matters. Like, you know, why would you ask me questions about fame? None of that stuff <clears throat> matters. In the end of the day, you know, like no, none of that is important to the universe. Oh, Nicolas Cage and Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, but I think they're more... I don't know. They're, they're two weird peas in the pod, but I mean, I don't know. See, that's the whole thing. So if you look at it like that and sort of put it in that context and sort of wrap this up in a weird sort of way, uh, it's entirely possible, I suppose, that it would be uh, maybe an idea that these things that we see and have reports of but can't never really get any tangible proof or anything like that is because they're supernatural. And maybe the supernatural really isn't supernatural at all. It's just all these parallel worlds and universes that keep bumping into each other and weird stuff happens. And maybe our universe doesn't actually exist. Maybe our universe, our existence right now has been shifted over because the one that we were in before the Mandela effect took place doesn't exist anymore. And that's why these weird things that we see that strike us as being weird is because they just never happened. I don't know. I'm hung up on and can't get over the use of the word supernatural in this weird colloquial manner that addresses everything odd instead of what I think of it as, I mean, cause we're going into parallel dimension and ultra terrestrial theory. Yeah, exactly. Not supernatural, which I associate with witches and magic and religious or spiritual. Well, if origin. you go into the old library or go into the bookstore and try to buy supernatural books, you don't really find what you're talking about. You find those in the fantasy section. No. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> fantasy section. No. Only. According to the libraries here, anything in that realm doesn't even get put in the religious rows of the library they get put in quote unquote philosophy well, of course that's the end all be all yeah because that leads me to this point why is it that when we go and we have set up our podcast and most people that have a paranormal or a supernatural style podcast you don't have a freaking choice of selecting paranormal yeah. or supernatural or anything like that you have to pick philosophy but yet if you're a murder podcast you can select the category murder or true crime yeah. It doesn't make sense to me because when you're looking for our podcast or any other paranormal podcast, you won't find them by searching necessarily as a category paranormal. No. You'll find us under philosophy, society, culture, and whatever else you can pick. We even tested So that's it. a that's a bug for yeah. me. It's like why don't we have our own section called paranormal? Hmm. Well, okay, so and that's like for a while we tested under news and entertainment that didn't work either and um a podcast we admire mysterious universe they've put themselves under science and technology a few times yeah 
So it really sort of depends, but there really needs to be a supernatural or paranormal or something sort of specific category when you have to categorize your oh, podcast. society and culture, I think, is the one all of us are trying right now. Well, that's the one that you have to. That's yeah. the one, the only one that sort of makes sense. You have society and culture, and there's like four categories underneath it. And one of those is philosophy, <laughs> right? And yeah. then religious philosophy, and then something else. So it doesn't make any sense. So if you're listening, podcast category making people, Whoever they would be, it'd be just like trying to call the government for the drones, you know, (laughs) give us our own category, man, make it easy because you have to search, you know, you're going to use the keyword paranormal and it's just ridiculous. But anyway, Mm -hmm. I think at this point, we're going to take a a quick second and play a commercial and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Creep Geeks podcast. It's audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, the listeners of the Creep Geeks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day free trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook. Enjoy this with your free trial. 30 days of membership free, plus two free audiobooks that are yours forever. One credit a month after trial, good for any book, regardless of price. Exclusive member savings, get 30% off additional audiobooks, easy exchanges, go love a book, swap it for free, anytime, seriously. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook today. And we're back. Oh. Yeah. No, I'm just... Got a weird look on your face. Yeah, it's the next thing that we're going to talk about. Uh, yeah. Because we actually kind of hinted at this one uh, several podcast episodes ago um, when we were talking about something else. But there's other aspects of this this article that I think are much more important. We'll do it. Well, okay, so... We you open up this door, <laughs> counselor. Yeah. So, believe it or not, it's kind of rare for there to be, um, according to definition, bogs in mountainous regions. Um, swamps, basically. Now, we have a swamp in Burke County, North Carolina, and it's it's been under threat of development and stuff like that. And well, let's tell people what they... What reason why we're talking about it giving the background first okay we could just give them the name of the article that we read and then give them the background mountain swamp known for bigfoot sightings is being saved by nc conservationists yes and those nc conservationists are the foothills conservant conservancy of north carolina they're actually getting money from a private donor to save this area yes and um Wow, I actually talked to the McDowell Historical Society about this, too. Yes. Yeah. But I think it's awesome that this rare type of environment or ecosystem is being protected. The The blow-up that this is where multiple Bigfoot sightings have been reported is not what I'm impressed about about this article. We have quite a few accounts from a certain Bigfoot group that stuff's been spotted here. Yeah. But we also have reports of the Brown Mountain Lights in this area. Yes. Off Jonas Ridge. Yes. Yeah. So, well, and that was part of the reason why I kind of put this in here, too, is that evidently there used to be and still is a lot of bogs. Yeah. But a lot of them have been been sort of, you know, gone by the wayside, development. They've been drained. Drained or flooded. Yeah. Yeah. And this is one that, it sort of got attention because of the sightings, alleged sightings, because, again, until there's any real proof, everything is really alleged, right? Mm-hmm. And somebody privately bought 17 acres to make sure that this little particular spot, this bog, doesn't disappear, which is nice. Yeah. The Foothills Conservancy, right? And about the only thing that you can say for sure is that, according to this, there is a, a species of plant there called the Mountain Sweet Pitcher, Oh, that's which cool. Which is a beautiful but carnivorous plant which eats insects is there. And it's kind of creepy. These bogs, this particular bog area. And if you don't know what a bog is, um, 
the quotes go, a nutrient-poor, acidic, and saturated area. <laughs> or the dirt, right? Yeah. As you know, it's nutrient poor, it's acidic, and it's like saturated. And they have a nice little picture, and it just kind of looks like it just looks like anything. I mean, I don't know. It, it just looks like anywhere that's got a big wet spot, right? Like a small itty bitty lake kind of thing. It's like a swamp, but less life. Yeah, it's it. like a dry swamp. Yeah. Basically. So, but, but yeah, so I didn't realize that this was a big thing. And then, you know, this Appalachian Mount, Mount Appalachian Appalachian Mountain Swamp mm-hmm. that was well known for Bigfoot researchers is like, okay, um, I thought the area was more well known for the Brown Mountain Lights personally, which would make sense considering it's a bog. Yeah, and so yeah. and when they would say, oh well, you know, for the Brown Mountain like Swamp Gas, right? Swamp Gas is an excuse for everything, right? Yeah, you know, oh, it could be because of swamp gas and stuff, but you know. So it's kind of weird. So we know that it's a unique spe- species of plants and animals and insects that kind of habitate around there. So that's the reason why you'd want to preserve it, I guess, and not necessarily preserve it because of Bigfoot and not necessarily preserve it because of the Brown Mountain Lights, but because the indigenous stuff that's there is kind of rare in the fact that it's in that particular area and there's not that many mountain bog swamps. Yeah, right? less than 500 acres. Yeah. yeah. And so when you look at it, you're like, oh, okay, cool. But then they talk about Bigfoot a little bit and say, oh, there's been some sightings in that particular area. And so the article, which basically reads, Mountain Swamp Known for Bigfoot Sightings is Being Saved by North Carolina Conservationists. And it's like, I didn't realize they were being saved because of Bigfoot sightings. I thought they were being saved because it's they're running out of these things and it makes sense to save them because naturalistically or in a naturalist point of view, there's reasons why it should be saved. I mean, from yeah, from a conservationist point... Right. Just, just the fact that like certain fireflies that live in bogs, exactly, or or other carnivorous carnivorous plant, you yeah, know. or other insect insects that only live there, yeah, right? but not. And then they talk a little bit about Burke County with the with the lights, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Brown Mountain lights, and they call them ghost lights as well. And they also talk about witches from the 15th century settlers that were scared, and and then they they sort of tied into. Burke County's rugged mountains are also believed by some to be home to the legendary half man, half ape known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. <laughs> right? Sasquatch. Yeah. <laughs> and then it talks about, you know, like the, the local uh, cryptid research group that said eight sightings have been reported from around Jonas Ridge area um, in Burke County in the past five years. Hmm. I, I didn't know that there was that many. So it kind of ties into that. So, and then it says that, you know, the Nature Conservancy, who basically bought these seventeen acres, say bogs are one of North America's rarest and most incredible habitats. Yeah. Yep. And so there's nearly five thousand acres of bogs that were once in North Carolina, but only about five hundred of those acres remain because again they've been lost due to like draining. Um, well, ditching, one thing that's, development, things like that. One thing that's really common in this area as we do more research towards like paranormal and history is how many dams and things have flooded out or they've... Yeah, or re- entire communities have disappeared because of that, right? And redirecting rivers. And when you do planning like that from like a geologic and environmental standpoint, you're probably going to select a bog region because it'll be able to withstand the water. So, sure. I mean, that's the other reason these bogs are just dis- disappearing. Is because, it's already wet, yeah. so let's just flood it. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, I understand where they're coming from with the article talking about the bogs and stuff like that. Um, but this is from the Charlotte Observer, by the way. Talking there, about... There's yeah, other ways... Bigfoot's to, home. It's being saved. There are other ways to bring attention to a conservationist act besides using the word Bigfoot. Yeah, but none are as cool as Bigfoot. If you were like, hey, the mountain pitcher plant eats bugs and it's being saved in a bog, you're like, whatever, I don't care. Bigfoot's home's being saved. Like, yay! We're saving Bigfoot's home. Yay! It's... I don't know. I Personally, I would think that there would be way more sightings than just like eight in the past five years if... I mean, look at Brown Mountain Lights. Those things have been sighted since the 15, 1600, something like that, even earlier. Yeah. 
you think there'd be more unless this thing travels, if it is, a, you know, an existing thing and it travels or has a, some kind of migratory pattern. Maybe it's just being here now, but I don't know. Who knows? Bogs are, I don't know. I know in Virginia, bogs, there would be a large... I mean, I don't think I would drink that bog water if I was Bigfoot. No, but it's weird that large predators will be near those areas. Because, you know, I used to hike in some bog areas in Virginia, and... That wasn't even a bog. I was You were hiking in swamp areas. Yeah, but even, like, towards, like, Suffolk, those areas, like yeah. the Washington Ditch and stuff like that, those were considered bog. Lots of bears for some reason. Lots of stink. Wolves. And I saw swamp fire. Yeah. So... I don't know. And, and plus the cool thing, I think the the carnivorous plant is awesome. It is awesome. I mean, you get the Venus flytrap too. Which is what I was going to bring yeah. up was North Carolina is home to a carnivorous plant, you know, that called the pitcher and the Venus flytrap. Yep. That's cool. It's also home to a lime green puppy. <laughs> so it's lime green puppy that made the, uh, I seen it in the news and thought it was a cool picture. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really look lime green to me. It looks more like yellow, but I guess that's the white balance of the camera that took the picture. And he the looks, article says, dog gives birth to lime green puppy. So, of course, I'm going to click on it. It looks yellow like that curry seagull. It looks yellow like Tweety Bird. <laughs> yellow. Right? Yeah. A North Carolina family said they were stunned when their white German shepherd gave birth to a lime green puppy. Right? Cool. Their dog, Gypsy, had a litter of eight puppies Friday. And this was, uh, whenever this was... January 16th, I think. Oh. And they were shocked. Like three he was three. lime green. <laughs> right? So, a veterinary technician at the Junaluska Animal Hospital. And Junaluska, in case you were wondering, uh, Omi, is about 60 miles away from here. Really? Yep. Anyway, okay. um, a veterinary technician at the Junaluska Animal Hospital says, sometimes puppies are born green when their fur is stained by meconium, which is stool from an infant mammal in the womb. Oh. So, His veterinarians. Brothers and sisters pooed on him. That's why he's green. Yep. Oh. So, veterinarians said the green color will eventually fade, and the puppy named Hulk will end up likely with a white coat. So, if you see a lime green puppy, he's probably stained with poo poo. Oh. You should probably wash your hands. That's so awful. Yep. No. Yeah. There you go. Call and so they, they called him Hulk. Now, what are they going to do? What are they going to call him when he's not Hulk anymore? Just like Bruce Banner, right? Yeah. Come here, Bruce Banner. You know what, though? It'd be funny because you got to wonder if maybe he's like the runt of the litter. That would be like an inside joke. I don't know. See, that, that's something that I looked at to see, you know, and they don't really say which, like, which one out of the eight yeah. he was. So, but you gotta think but, if he's the is only he in one his, that's see, here's, colored, he, okay, yeah, okay. If you have a litter of eight puppies, each one of those things are in their own little amniotic sack, right? I don't know. So did he poo on his own self? Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I thought it was kind of neat. There's a a lime green puppy that was born in North Carolina, and I'm like, well, since we were talking about the bog thing, it made sense to talk more about North Carolina. And then this next article, which, you know. Honestly, came about because we were talking about um, pizza one night, and you were like, one day, we're just going to go get a pizza, because where we are, pizza doesn't deliver. Yeah. So, to put that in perspective, and you're probably shocking, because, you know, we don't have internet. We have satellite internet, because of where we're located. It takes a while for us to actually drive to get cell phone service, and if you order a pizza from Domino's or Papa John's or anywhere like that, they're not coming. Nope. So, this family in North Carolina... I had a terrible experience and one that would probably make me want to burn my whole house down, much like <laughs> our neighbors who set their entire front yard and backyard on fire just the other night. Oh, I guess God. they didn't have to rake leaves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. And there is a picture on the Instagrams, um, or there will be. I thought you put that on Instagram. No, it's going someplace else. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll put a picture up somewhere Yeah. eventually. But anyway... So what hap- what had happened was this family, right? Yeah. Gonna have some pizza. The they didn't say which one it was or what kind it was, but from looking at it, it looks kind of like a DiGiorno, like personal pizza that you can buy, right? 
<laughs> like you go to the store and you buy it. And, yeah. Anyway, it says North Carolina family said they lost their appetite for pizza when they discovered a snake had slithered into their oven and had been cooked with the oh. intended entree. So these people are in Wake Forest, North Carolina. It says their kitchen filled with smoke while they were baking a pizza this week, and they looked in the oven to discover a snake had found its way to the bottom of the oven. Oh, that's surprising. I'm watching the video. I was expecting a much different type of person. Well, that's probably a personal problem thing that you need to address. I know. You're just automatically going to lump. You never know. But I thought it says, they'd look like. No, <laughs> just stop. So the oven started smoking. Like This person, we're not going to say who it is. Her name is Amber Helm. She was like, the oven started smoking, and I told my boys to back up so I could make sure their fire or anything didn't happen. And I looked closely, and I was like, oh, my God, that's a friggin' snake. And then she said the family lost interest in pizza, so they went out to eat. <laughs> so, and, they, and I like how she says, we did not eat the pizza. I hear a lot of people asking the question, did we eat the pizza? And she said, no. Right? I know a lot of families have been like, we paid eight dollars for this crappy DiGiorno <laughs> pizza. We're going to eat it, right? So she said uh, the couple have uh, has said they plan to have their house inspected by a pest expert to figure out where the snake came from <laughs> and to make sure there aren't any more slithering surprises in the house. And they said the oven will need to go through some thorough cleaning before they're ready to use it again. It's in double triple cleaning mode. I cleaned it through a cycle last night. It's soaking now. The grill grates have been pulled, so they're cleaning this thing up. Oh, it's. It's the, it's the very affordable pizza that we've had a few times. Is it Red Baron? No, it's the Walmart one that's only two dollars and something. Two dollars and seventy eight cents. <laughs> you know, as terrible as Walmart says, that pizza is not bad. It's the pepperoni one. Ah, uh, yep. yeah. Now, see, they're going to call and get a pest control expert out there, and if that ever happens to us, we won't have that problem because we won't have a house. We will burn this thing to the ground. Because it's kind of like ladybugs. Once they get in your house, man, that's it. You'll find them forever. Well, the And we've already had a problem this year, by the way. If you follow us at all on any of our social media presences, we had a snake in our living room. And people said, oh, he's just little. He won't hurt you. It doesn't matter. He was anaconda size. We put him in a five-gallon bucket and took him outside because evidently he came in a hoodie. Yeah. Which is super scary. And... You know, I may have thrown that five-gallon bucket really hard across the yard by accident, trying to get the snake out of the bottom of it. It's okay. He was feisty. He didn't like you. No, he didn't. I didn't like him either. And you know what? I would have hated him on my pizza. You know what's worse? And that snake is awful looking. Yeah. I don't know how big it is. Is it small? Well, okay. In the picture, it looks like it's about 17 feet long and about, you know, big rounds of trash no, can. it doesn't. It doesn't my Okay, world. so if that pizza's this big and okay. he's like this big, he's only but, about... But he was at the bottom of the oven. We don't really know. Well, yeah. He's on some kind of box. It's the box for that that particular brand of pizza. That's kind of a big snake. Yeah, plus some junk mail. <laughs> Actually, it's the top of the Walmart. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is. So, anyway, so. that's disgusting. So, these people, and that, be, you know, is um, a horrible. No, I was just expecting these people to look like the type of people that might set their whole yard on fire. And they're not. They're very nice yeah. people. But their house, like, towards the end of the video, totally backs up on some scary woods. Yeah. So. That's probably where that unintentional snake came from. Yeah. And that's that's how we come across the unintentional snake pizza. Ugh. So. Yeah. There you go. That's disgusting. And I'm pretty sure I would have burned the house down. And then the read more is all more snakes that have been found in terrible things. Like deadly snake found in Australian couple's dishwasher. Snake stows away on a flight. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That's not nearly as good as the guy that goes up to open the door and the snake comes off the <laughs> comes off the little light, the little porch light, and just bites him in the face. You see that? And like bit him on his head. Yeah. And that actually happened. I thought that happened in North Carolina. It happened somewhere in the country. Where this, I think maybe South Carolina, where the snake is like you know popped off the light and busted him in the head, right? And then he freaks out and then he runs up running back in the house and he's like, "I gotta go to the hospital. I just got bit by a snake." <laughs> And so we were talking about that snake attack coming Oklahoma. off. Oklahoma. Oh, it was, yes, right, it was Oklahoma. About that snake biting that guy in the face. Mm-hmm. What did our country friends say? Well, it's that time of year. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not true, man. There is no such thing as like snake biting you in the face season. Yeah. It's like, you can't. Yeah, come on, man. I was born in North Carolina and I've never heard of that before. 
So yeah, so that was pretty terrible, right? That's oh, some and nightmare then the stuff. Giant snake skin I found in our yard. It's like seven feet long. And here's a fun fact. So Omi finds this like intact mm. snake skin. And seriously, it's like seven feet long. Yeah. And the cool thing was is that it was attacked. It was in it was intact, right? But the cool thing was is that it smelled really bad. Yeah. And it's like something I didn't expect. So which means that and I've smelled that before being out in the woods and never really put a, you know Really? Put a face to it. Well yeah. Oh. Because if you're in a swamp, it smells like ass. It all smells I mean, how are you gonna know what the if that had a specific smell to it and now that I know, you know, it's like there you go. That thing smelled really bad. I don't even know where it went. What we do with that thing? One of our friends took it. Okay, well there you go. Yeah, so and was it good. wasn't totally intact. It was missing the head and the tail. The head? No, I had the tail. It was missing probably this much to the head. Nobody can see what you're doing. Oh, here. So about about four inches or so. Mm. It was really long. Anyway, speaking of dreams. <laughs> yes. Okay. So the last news article before we round out our podcast and, and finish our podcast is this Virginia woman. Since we were talking about North Carolina, and yeah. we used to live in Virginia, had to throw some Virginia stuff in there, right? And we talked about dreams a little bit. You know, yeah. the parallel universe thing. Virginia woman wins $100,000 using numbers from a dream. Okay. Yes. It's from the Virginia Lotto. The lady's name, I'm not going to say her name, is Rose Jeter. And she won $100,000 because it's in the picture. Yeah. Because that was part of it. And so she won a $100,000 jackpot from the state's lottery, Cash 5, saying that her winning numbers came to her in a dream. Wow. Yeah. And so the numbers, 7, 12, and you know what's funny about 7, 12, right? What? It's my birthday. Yes. Right? 14 and 21. <laughs> You know what the funny thing about 7 and 14 is, right? They're double of each other. And then 21 is triple of each other. And then 27 has nothing to do with it. But if you add all those numbers up together, right? Anyway, so she had those numbers that came to her in a dream a couple years ago. And I guess she's been playing them. Yeah. And she finally won. So her dream numbers came up December 31st and it earned her a $100,000 prize. That's pretty cool, though. Yep. So. And so the odds are pretty high, one in 278,256. Yeah. So after all of her winnings are collected, being as it's, it's Virginia, she'll get about $32 <laughs> out of the whole thing. And a bill. <laughs> yeah. And a bill. And the funny thing is, is that you know how they give you those big giant checks? Yeah. So evidently, they the Virginia Lotto. They, they have this big giant check, and it's obviously one that they reuse. Mm-hmm. Because in the picture of her holding this big giant check, you can see where it looks like white tape that they printed out December oh, 31st, so 2019. Yeah. And then the name has been printed out. So it's like they, they printed out her name on this tape and stuck it to this reusable giant check. And the funny thing is that in the date area, instead of just putting DEC, for December, they put the entire December 31, 2019. So it kind of like almost goes past the edge of the check. Yeah. The $100,000 in the in the area where you write $100,000 on the check is all crooked. It's it's just like, it looks pretty bad. You know. It's like, way to be professional. I, at one point, one of my jobs in New Mexico, I actually got to talk to somebody who had won a lottery in New Mexico. It was like some sort of lottery or contest and they got the big giant check. Yeah. After everything was said and done, when they got off stage and off presentation and stuff like that, there's this form that they filled out, and they had to pay for the check to, that was printed. They didn't even opt for it. That's like the price is right. It, you know? and, and you it win like, all these prizes, but you got to pay the taxes. It was $59 for that giant check. <laughs> it's like I wouldn't want the big giant check. I'd be like, can't you just hand me a regular check? And he, he was like, I didn't even, they said I had to, you know, present this check and there had to be this big old deal. And it's like publisher's like, clearinghouse running up to your house, giving yeah. you a big giant check and say, oh, here you go. Go ahead and pay us $100 for this big giant check. You know, and I was just like, man, so they charged you for the check that you didn't even want. <laughs> That's not even real. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, since that lady's numbers won her some money and they came to her from a dream, um, this, we're going to add this one in here because it's also Virginia and this happened recently. And it kind of goes like this. Wife's need for a lighter 
leads man to $500,000 lottery prize. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Because he looks like the kind of guy that has to go to the store a lot. <laughs> like his wife's like run up to the store like he's going to run some errands all the time. Uh-huh. So this Virginia man scored $500,000 on a jackpot, one of those little scratch-off lottery ticket things, thanks to his wife's need for a new lighter. Right? Cool. Huh. So basically, he said the only reason why he went to that local 7-Eleven was to buy a lighter for his wife. But while he was at the store, right, and mm-hmm. he seen a display of Virginia Virginia lottery scratcher tickets, it caught his eye, and he went ahead and he bought four tickets, two for himself and two for his wife. So he's probably like, I'll show you. <laughs> so, yeah. And a display of, of civil dis- disobedience to his you know wife, yeah. he bought five tickets. Mm-hmm. Or well, actually bought two, four tickets. Two yeah. for him, two for his wife. And he said that one of his tickets, right? Yeah. Turned out to be a top prize winner. I said to my wife, we just won $500,000. And she said, let me see. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I put this in here. Because it's kind of funny because what he could have said was, they didn't have no lighters. And he was never seen again, right? <laughs> but I like that. He's like, I said to my wife, we just won $500,000. And she said, let me see. And he's like, no. So it looks like he's standing up to him. He's standing up for himself, I guess. I just thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> no. Because I would have said the same thing. Nope. It'd be like this. You can't see it. You, <laughs> you so, would do that. I know, it would be funny. But, you know, so he had to go. And the only reason why he went was to get a lighter. And while he was there, he went in and bought those tickets. I just think that's funny. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like, hey. Can you go to the store and get me a Slurpee, you know, and a bag of chips and a lighter while you're there? She was like, go get me a lighter. Oh. So he went up there, and he's like, I'll show you. I'm going to buy four lottery tickets. <laughs> right? He's like, it's a civil disobedience. He's like, you don't buy me four lottery tickets. One of my tickets won $500,000. Let me see. No. Anyway. <laughs> But that was pretty funny. So at this point of the podcast, we go ahead and we'll start to wrap it up because we've been talking for a little while. And the Creep Beats podcast, we do this, you know, like we talk about stuff weekly. Yeah. And we also talk about things that are upcoming for us and upcoming events. And so at this point, I'm going to let Omi tell you all about that. Well, hold on. Wait. <clears throat> Wait. What? Oh, I'm glad I held on. So some big news from us is that we will be on another podcast. Soon, we're looking at dun, dun, dun. January 24th. Uh, there is a new podcast, well, relatively new podcast out there called Bigfoot Quest. Be sure to check our Facebook for links and information on that. Yeah, let's just tell you that we actually met. Um, well, I don't want to give it away, but anyway, we, we met him at the Pennsylvania Conference on the Unexplained. Yeah, and it kind of went like this we chatted for a while, and he was like, Hey, man. He doesn't talk like that, but I don't know. But he said, hey, man, I, I I have a show. You should be on the show. And I do YouTube videos. And I was like, what a coincidence. <laughs> so do we. We do the same thing. And we're like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. But anyway, we're actually going to go ahead and do that. So we, we did a little testing to make sure that our uh, top secret kung fu uh, adventure mobile, the albino rhino. Remote broadcast system. Yeah. Our remote broadcasting adventure mobile destruction is ready. And we tested it, it works, so we're going to give it a shot. So, yeah, it's called Bigfoot Quest. Yep. And uh, it'll be on Facebook, I believe. So, check our social media for links on that. And also give a like to Bigfoot Quest. Um, now, I do want to remind everybody March 21st, we are looking at Mysteries and Monsters in Canton, Canton Ohio. Yeah, it's Small Town Monsters. With small guys. Town Monsters. We have a link to that on our Facebook as well. Be sure to buy tickets and check it out. That event. Uh, I think it's going to go very well. Yeah, you get to watch like five hours of Small Town Monsters for like 12 bucks. And the debut of On the Trail. Actually, it's more than that. Yes, it is. Because it's going to be all day Small Town Monsters And it goes into the night a little bit. And there's going to be breaks. So if you're like, I don't want to go sit in in an old haunted movie theater and watch movies. You can pay just 12 bucks, I think, just to see the premiere. So, and that was announced on Monsteropolis. Yep. Uh, and we'll put a link to Monsteropolis in the uh, yeah. show notes as well. Um, but yeah, it was pretty inexpensive. It was like 12 bucks to be able to, or 20 bucks. To, I can't remember how much it cost, but it was like under 20 bucks to be able to go see like eight hours of like cryptid stuff. And meet some really cool people, yep. listen to some very cool lectures and presentations. Plus, 
there's some really cool vendors that are going to be there. Yep. Including us. That's true. Um, including Wild and Weird West Virginia, I believe. Yep. So that's the other th- big announcement we have. April 4th, 2020, we will be at Wild and Weird Con, presented by Wild and Weird West Virginia. Yep. We have a link to that, too. Should be fun. Yeah. Very nice. Anyway, that's about all I got. Yep. So there you go. So anyway, thanks for tuning in to the Little Creepy Geeks podcast. This was episode number 163. Bigfoot's Home Safe, Chupacabra, Lime Green Puppy, and Unintentional Snake Pizza. So, we make new content every week, podcast episode every week, so you should subscribe and listen if you like the show. Thumbs up, wherever you're listening. You know, do they have thumbs up for iTunes? Just just rate us. It's all good. (laughs) Go to Facebook, check us out. Yeah, I can't remember, man. Uh. So. It's like some stars or something like that. But anyway, any questions, comments, concerns, let us know. It's been a Creepy Podcast. We'll see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye.